Hello and welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining the Commonwealth Chamber Hong Kong and the Consulate General of Pakistan in Hong Kong's joint webinar today on Pakistani tech startups. I'm Julia Charlton, the current chair of the Commonwealth Chamber in Hong Kong, and we are super excited to introduce you to this dynamic and amazing panel of startups who are making themselves known not only on the local, but also on the international radar. Startups in Pakistan have gained more funding in the first three quarters of 2021 than in the previous six years combined, which is really quite amazing. Pakistani tech startups are leading this great performance. And as Pakistan's trade um, and tourism industry flourishes um, and its current 257 billion US dollar consumer market continues to expand, these startups are part of the pioneers of Pakistan's digital economy. So we're very pleased to have here with us today. Um, we have the CEO of Khalid uh, Memon of Apricart, and Taser Tech is represented by its co-founder, Abra Bajwa. And our moderator together with myself for today is Asim Malik, consul at the Consulate General of Pakistan here in Hong Kong. But we're most honored and delighted to first introduce you to the Consul General of Pakistan, Mr. Bilal Ahmed Butt, who will give an introductory speech before we begin our panel discussion. Just a little housekeeping before we begin, the webinar will be approximately one hour long with a Q&A session following the tech company's presentations. Please feel free to share with us your questions in the Q&A box at any time during the webinar, and we'll do our best to get to those. So without further ado, I invite Consul General Bilal Ahmed Butt to say a few words. Consul General. Thank you, Julia. Asalaamu Alaikum. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and privilege that Commonwealth Chamber has uh, invited me to this uh, webinar and they have uh, organized this webinar in collaboration with the, with the consulate. And it's pleasure and privilege that the that I have been invited. I would, at the onset, I would like to give an overview of IT sector of Pakistan. Pakistan is a country with 220 million of population where 64% of our population is below the age of 30, whereas 29% of our population is between 15 and 29 years of age. We have 23,000 IT graduates every year. And in Pakistan, there are more than 76 million smartphone users and 78 million broadband users. We have 173 higher education commission recognized universities in Pakistan. So you can imagine the size of our population and our education sector. Pakistan exported around 3 billion US dollar uh, IT and IT enabled services during the last year. IT services sector is doubling in size after every four years. E-commerce is expanding in Pakistan, though currently its size is only 1.5 billion US dollars, but we expect that it will grow exponentially as we have young population and our young generation is more inclined towards the e-commerce business and its products. More than 7,000 tech companies are doing business in Pakistan. These companies are providing myriad of services including BPO services, gaming and animation, mobile application, IT support services, blockchain, artificial intelligence, software development, and system integration. Commonwealth Chamber of Hong Kong is a forum that can provide an opportunity to IT professionals from Pakistan to not only broaden their horizon, but also to get connected with large number of nations having a lot in common. Furthermore, Hong Kong has developed financial markets and offers greater opportunities to fintechs and in other fields like artificial intelligence, blockchain, and cybersecurity for marketing new products. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Project and the Belt and Road Initiative has also brought new opportunities for Pakistani entrepreneurs. 
to expand their businesses in this part of the world. We understand and given that the size of the global information technology industry is more than 5 trillion US dollars, the share of Pakistan is much less than desired. By creating an enabling environment for professionals to invent, establishing backward linkages within the country with the young people and forward linkages with the global markets is the need of the hour. So cognizant of the fact, the government of Pakistan and all our provincial, which are the regional governments, they are investing a lot in establishing IT parks to create an enabling environment and to provide a complete ecosystem to create synergies to expand IT sector. Government of Pakistan is also providing financial and other incentives to IT professionals and companies to facilitate them to expand their businesses, not only in the local, but in the global markets. Incentive to the industry include zero income tax on IT and IT enabled services exports till 2025. Tax breaks for the Pakistan Software Export Board registered IT companies startups for three years up to 100% ownership of IT and IT enabled services companies, up to 100% repatriation of profits for foreign IT and IT enabled services investors, and tax holidays for venture capital funds till 2025 among the other incentives. I would invite investors and companies from Hong Kong and other Commonwealth countries to invest in Pakistan IT sector, to collaborate with Pakistani companies in the form of the joint ventures, to create synergies, to benefit from a win-win situation. At the end, I would congratulate Ms. Julia, Chairman of Commonwealth Chamber and her team for organizing this much needed event. I would also appreciate efforts of Mr. Asim, our counselor for coordinating for the webinar. However, it may just the beginning of the cooperation between Commonwealth Chamber and Consulate General of Pakistan. I would be looking forward to participate and arrange such kind of giant events in future to deepen our friendship and enhance business opportunities for entrepreneurs from all sides. So Julia, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much all the participants. Welcome on board and uh, I would request to proceed with the rest of the activities of the webinar. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Mr. Bilal Ahmed. That was wonderful. And we're very honored that you gave such a fruitful talk to start off this webinar. Thank you also for your kind words about the Commonwealth Chamber. So I would like to now introduce the first startup for this afternoon, which is Apricart, initially known as Aeroso Cart, which was set up when COVID was at its peak in 2020. And it was set up for the purpose of providing people who lost employment to cushion the impact of the devastating economic toll caused by the global pandemic, which has affected all of us. And it was rebranded in April this year. So Apricart is a smart shopping cart that seeks to improve the shopping experience for retail grocery shoppers while gathering important path to purchase data for consumers, packaged goods, marketers, and grocery stores. So may I invite the CEO, Khaled Memon, to tell us all about this exciting uh, startup. Thank you very much, Julia. And thank you very much, Hong Kong Commonwealth and Pakistan High Commission for inviting us and giving us this opportunity and platform, excellent platform to uh, showcase Africa and what we are doing. So I will, so Apricot, as you've briefly explained, we are obviously in crossing market. But before that, I would just like to uh, tell you a little story about what, what happened with me when I visited uh, Pakistan last year, the year before pre-COVID, during my holiday from UK, and wanted to go for grocery. And something like this encountered outside grocery stores in Karachi, one of the largest cities of Pakistan. So this is the queue outside a grocery store in Pakistan. And it took me around 40 
This was the scene of the parking outside the grocery store. And this was the queues inside when I had to check in, check out my grocery. So after battling with the wobbly trolleys and uh, finding the right product uh, from the aisles, uh, I finally got into the queue and it took me around three hours just to spend 4,000 rupees worth of shopping. So why is it so? Now let's look at, dig in deeper what's going on. This is, this is a very interesting forum in the World Economic Forum last year. It shows that what is the consumer market size from 2020 to 2030. Pakistan, which stands at number 14th in the consumer market size, it is expected to reach seventh position uh, by 2030. So that is the side of the market that we are looking at. Let's validate them from the stats as uh, His Excellency also explained the same. Total population of 220 million and average spending of a household is 42% on the grocery and food. So whatever they earn, Pakistanis, they spend around 42% on the grocery. That brings the annual revenue of the grocery market to 53 billion USD in 2020, which is growing at the CAGR of 8.3% per year. So approximately, which will reach circa $85 billion. Now, but is it the, what is the reason behind such a crowded stores? The main reason is basically the lack of large stores, which can offer uh, a full good quality availability of the goods at the affordable price. So I'm not talking about the quality here. It's just the availability of the product and at affordable. So it's clearly an underserved market, which needs to be looked at. Now, when I went back to UK and uh, COVID was at its peak and people were struggling with the groceries, I just look at the potential of the market as well. Now, 60% of the population is under the age of 60 uh, and we've got 61 million internet user, which are increasing the circa. Now, 6%, 6% of shopping is just done online. And it is estimated that by with, by 2025, 2026, it will reach around 25% of the rural market, obviously increasing at a rapid pace. This is also validated by Central Bank of Pakistan's report, which is the State Bank of Pakistan payment review report, which says the quarter and quarter payment on e-commerce is growing with 4%. So there's a Pakistan, there's a significant market, significant potential. So I left my few startups that I started in the UK, came to Pakistan, to uh, build Apricard, to just to bridge the gap from problem to the solution and to the potential. What is Apricard? What we are offering? It is basically uh, a reliable, convenient stock, fast because it's a time of Q commerce and e-commerce. It's a combination of two and price competitive solution. That's what we offer. We deliver uh, groceries to your doorsteps done by app or internet website within 15 minutes, as fast as 15 minutes or maximum 90 minutes, depending upon the area you are in or the gross you are doing. So it's a complete platform, which is offering uh, convenience uh, and a price competitive goods to you. There are a few other startups in Pakistan who are offering the similar service because it's a time for Q-commerce and e-commerce, but not many as it's a huge market to capture. The key part is the number of SKUs. Uh, Normally, companies nowadays, they are focusing more on the speed of delivery rather than the variety of goods and the price. Um, at Apricot, we are basically, we have got more than 20,000 SKUs, which is equivalent to any large supermarket. And we are offering fast delivery through dark store model. We're currently starting in Karachi and planning to expand in Pakistan, across Pakistan, and perhaps in some other uh, Commonwealth countries very soon. So since the inception, we have already reached more than 250 orders per day, and we have a retention of 86% of our customers. And our current AOV is $12 per order, just because of the basket size and the availability of product. And we want to, the aim is to really change the way Pakistan does its grocery, not only the cravings, but the entire monthly basket, which basically can save them hassle, save them uh, money, both of them, and they can get uh, all these reliable products on just tap of the finger. 
Some market size we've already spoken about, I've just explained. We do have a robust unit economics and Q-commerce across. Basically, they are more focusing on, on, on the speed, whereas we are focusing not only on speed, but our own sustainability. And then we are building a nice contribution margins. Our leadership team, my co-founders and team, at the time of start of Apricard, it was, it is, uh, I thought it is really critical to basically select the team, which is basically, uh, which can make the success. You can see uh, some phase which you usually do not see as a co-founder. So I've got Mr. Jahangir Siddiqui, who is the, one of the top 10 businessmen of Pakistan. He's, he's in his early seventies. I was so excited with this idea that he, he joined us in starting this venture and assemble a team from industry of retail market technology as to just build this platform because it's completely the way Pakistan is shopping. So the technology, the retail supply chain, it's the entire thing, which needs to be synchronized, joined together and build this platform. It's, it's just completely evaluation of grocery, which we call grocery 4.0 as this has been transformed. And later on, our uh, ambition is to make it a grocery management system where people do not worry about finding the right price, finding the right product, the right time or forgetting anything. So AI enabled or tech, heavy tech enabled or deep tech enabled system can just do everything. And uh, our supply chain at back of it can take care of your monthly grocery. I think my time will be up. So I'm happy to take the questions. It's, it's a, just a brief introduction about what we are doing. I have a lot to uh, talk about in terms of target customer acquisitions and everything. But uh, I think I would to take the question if anybody's interested, we will share the presentation and explain them in detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Khaled. That was so interesting. So you, there will be opportunity for people who are listening to, for you to respond to their questions when we've heard from the next startup, which is Tazar Tech, and they're also going to give a presentation. So Tazar Tech is an innovative B2B startup, which give an online fresh produce marketplace, connecting businesses directly to farmers with an aim of looking at the inefficiency to some extent of Pakistan's quite complex agricultural value chain end to end through the use of tech innovation and providing benefits to both all parties. They're looking at trying to ensure relatively stable prices, relatively standardized quality, doorstep delivery, and a convenient mobile ordering interface available. So we will now um, hear from Abra, who is a co-founder, who's going to tell us about Tezar Tech. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Very honored to be here. I will not you know, take too much time. I'll just quickly talk about what we're doing at Taza so far, what has been our journey so far, and where does the journey take us from here? So my name is Abrad. I'm the co-founder at Taza. Together with me, uh, with Mohsin, who's my co-founder on this, uh, we've been building Taza since June this year. Um, Taza, like Julia said, is a B2B marketplace for fresh produce. We try to solve the access to capital and access to market problem for millions of farmers and businesses. Pakistan, as you might be aware of, is uh, a $60 billion agriculture. Pakistan has a $60 billion agriculture space. 20% of our GDP comes from here. 40% of our workforce is associated with it one way or the other. It's also one of the most under-technical, or how would you say this? So it's almost also one of the most inefficient sectors that exists in Pakistan. It's, and it's mainly because of stru structural reasons. We talk about millions of farmers on one end, millions of businesses on the other end. We're trying to fix that. We're trying to solve for millions of farmers who, at the end of the day, only get 25% of the final produce price. So a case of, for example, if a farmer sells it for 25 cents, the customer gets it for $1. So the price multiplies by almost four times for almost all produce items, just because of the inefficiencies that exist in this value chain. We at Taza are solving for them. We've had a short and very productive journey so far. Um, <clears throat> We started out in June. We've, got, we've recently closed another four and a half million dollars round. Now we're raising another twenty. As far as the growth is concerned, it has been super. Like it has been quite big so far. We've been able to grow at a very high pace. Currently, our revenue is close to six million dollars, and the idea is to get it to you know close to uh, around ten, twelve million dollars by the next couple of months. Quickly, would want to talk about what market are we talking about, which is best represented through slides, and uh, we're talking about. Uh, very large 57 to 60 billion dollars market 
broken down into large pieces. There's livestock and then there's crops. Crops have a much higher vulnerability to disruption because of the extreme inefficiencies that exist over there. And therefore, that is our first, that has been our first line of attack. And one of those extreme inefficiencies I talked about, that case or kilo of mangoes moving across the supply chain. But you know, what happens is that you know, as a producer, you only make 30% of what you sell. And the remaining is lost between multiple middlemen and inefficiencies within the supply chain. It is a very sort of at the number of times it moves between one part to the other. There's logistics and warehousing involved, and that leads to additional costs. Uh, there's wastage because of multiple pieces of handling and poor incentives to produce high quality, and because there is no supply demand matching, which leads to a lot of wastage. There's also information asymmetry and the middlemen also charge an arm and a leg to sort of get the product across. And therefore, it ends up in a situation where not only the producers make a very small amount, but also it leads to at a macro level, a very high, leads to food price inflation in the country. And these are some problems that we're solving. Once Taza comes into play, and it is in play now, what you will get at scale is Taza market skipping some of their steps and uh, selling directly to small and large fruit and vegetable sellers. For the farmers, what this essentially means, it, it translates into a higher price for them. It translates into prompt payments, it translates into reduced sales effort and access to capital eventually once we get into the financial products. For the retailers, anybody who sells fresh produce is supply constraint. That's an insight that we've seen in the market. So what they get is for all these retailers, what you get is transparent and competitive pricing, a standardized quality and the ability to order 24-7 at, you know, with a very low procurement effort. So there are multiple benefits for both ends of the value chain, plus, you know, a macro level benefit with which means that essentially at scale taza would lead to reduction in food prices for customers so this is what we're doing we have a customer app through which our some small, small businesses place their orders it is a work in progress and we're continuously deploying and building a platform of multiple apps including our delivery app warehouse management app and a farmer app all of them are in the works but at this point in time we have we have the customer app through which most of our customers place their orders. This is more technical. We've been growing super fast since we, since we started out four months back. Uh, we are now at around, we have around seven, but actually the month day, we, we have around 700, 750, this slide has been dated. We have around 750 daily active customers now. And uh, we just launched. And in terms of customer retention, we, our customers encounter very high retention. And we have very strong forecasts for growth in the coming months. Yeah, that's like a high level summary of what we do at Taza and happy to take questions in the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Abra. That was extremely informative. You packed a lot of information into that, that short time. Thank you so much. So both of these companies, are, I think, are extremely exciting. Those are the pitches that we're listening to. So we're now going to ask questions. And my co-moderator, Asim, would you like to go first for the first question uh, for our, these two wonderful startups? Yes. Uh, thank you, Julia, uh, for giving me the floor. My first question would, of, of course, be from uh, Epicart. Mr. Khalid, I have an advice for you also uh, with this kind of, you know, internet connection. You're not going to have a lot of <laughs> quick success because there was a lot of disruption in your voice when you were giving this presentation. So we might have missed a few points. Well, what are the prospects of taking uh, Epicard to other countries like to China uh, or other East Asian countries or maybe to Europe? So what do you see uh, your business uh, in the next few? Thank you, Asim. Uh, first of all, apologies uh, for that, for the disruption in internet connection sometimes things are unpredictable, but we'll definitely uh, take care of that in future. We, we, we do plan considering the consumer market growth and the uh, population density in countries like uh, uh, Indonesia or countries, in, including in, in, in South Africa and other Commonwealth countries. We are definitely planning once we establish our footprints in Pakistan and the model is proven, the supply chain is well established and everything. We do plan to take apricot abroad in other countries as well, because I, I, I see a huge potential uh, and it will change the way people uh, shop. Like cameras, people are hardly carrying uh, camera, Fuji or Kodak cameras in the events they're using the iPhones. So that is completely transformation of the way people will be doing groceries. In, in densely populated areas, especially in urban areas, there's a lot of traffic and other problems. So if there is a platform which can provide the entire solution and which is cost effective, so we can definitely do that. And um, I'm very interested to know what, also for you, Khalad, what percentage of groceries sold in Pakistan roughly are produced in Pakistan and what percentage are imported? In other words, 
if we're outside Pakistan, what have we got to look forward to in being able to access Pakistani products? On- in terms of the uh, national statistics, in terms of groceries, there is a lot of groceries con- produced and in- consumed in-house, like the staples. We are an agriculture control staple food like rice um, and flour and sugar. They are majority produced um, in the country, rice, in fact, we, we are the exporters, so cooking oils and all these staples, basically, which are the basic necessities are produced and consumed within the country. But some of the stuff are uh, imported as well, like uh, some cosmetics or other luxury products, they are imported from outside. But the government's recent initiative for pay- make in Pakistan is, is really taking some charge. And uh, soon we'll see that a lot of products will be basically produced in Pakistan. In terms of the export, uh, you can definitely expect uh, uh, a lot in the future. As, as a lot of companies, startups, they are focusing on promoting and exporting the goods from Pakistan, which I make in Pakistan in terms of agriculture, in terms of the factories. Uh, so we've got our own staple brand, which we plan to export outside uh, Pakistan as well. So perhaps you sitting in Hong Kong can order and we'll deliver you. So let me, Julia, uh, answer your question. Uh, as uh, you, you will be aware that Pakistan is basically is an agricultural country and 20% of our GDP comes through the agriculture sector. And even the kind of products which we make and export to the other nations, those are basically agricultural based. Like we are exporting 65% of our products, which are textile and textile made ups. And those are made from cotton and the rest of the things. Then we export certain products which are made from leather comes from the cattle head. And we are also exporting almost 400 million US dollar meat and its products, poultry. We are exporting more than 200 billion US dollar of rice every year to the other countries. We have almost 25 billion uh, US dollar exports. And this year we are expecting that it will go inshallah up to 30 billion US dollar. Out of that, 66% almost comes from textile and rest comes from other, as I mentioned, that leather, surgical goods, and rice, uh, and such kind of things. As we are a big country having a population of 220 million people, whatever we produce, like staple food is like in Hong Kong, it's rice, our staple food is wheat. Since our population, almost 60% of people live in the agriculture areas, whatever we produce, most of that is consumed by our local population. Normally, they store wheat during the harvesting season, and then they use it for the rest of the year. Similar is the case with the rice as well, and other crops, including vegetables and fruits. So we have very less surplus to export. This is the reason that we are exporting meat and its products and we are not exporting sugar. Sometimes if there is excess sugar cane crop, then the government allows for export of uh, sugar to the other countries. So this is overall landscape of our uh, export sector. We normally import from other countries petroleum and petroleum products, capital goods, mostly from China and mostly from China, yeah. So our major bill of imports goes towards petrol and petroleum products and capital goods and some consumer goods, you can say luxury goods and some automotives, mobiles, and these kind of things. So this is an overall overview of our import and export sectors. Though we grow all kinds of crops and fruits and vegetables, Pakistan is one of the largest producer of uh, wheat, cotton, sugarcane, maize, and rice. But since we are a big population and our productivity is at the middle of the continuum, we take care of our population through our production. And most of the staple foods are not imported by Pakistan. But as far as edible oil and petrol and petroleum products are concerned, we have to import them. So thank you. I I hope I did not take much. No, you're clearly an expert. That was a wonderful exposition. Thank you very much. We have some questions from the audience. And here's one from from, for Abra. uh, who And the question is, please, could you again give your motives, I guess, your reasons for establishing 
Tezar, perhaps the sort of short overview of it again, Abra, and perhaps for my benefit, you could speak slowly because you said so much in such a short time. Maybe you could just go through again why you think that Tezar is such a good value proposition, please. So we were working and, and mobility was a huge deep-rooted problem. Transport is, is pretty bad in Pakistan. So, you know, and with Kareem's arrival, what we saw was that a major mobility problem was solved for people. We'd done that first time, me and Mohsen. And we said, okay, now we've done that. What's even bigger, right? What's even a more larger impact problem? And what could be even more complex than this? Because if you're spending your next five, 10 years on a problem, it has to be very large and it has to be very complex. We looked around for multiple problems and then eventually we decided to get into agriculture. It's underinvested in Pakistan from a technology standpoint. It has huge benefit to for, for, a, for millions of people. So we want to create the largest impact in Pakistan. And we sort of, that's how we ended up in agriculture. We also are, have like agriculture family background. So it was a bit personal too. And therefore, sort of all of these factors combined, we got into what we got in. So it's technology, it's passion, and it's expertise and experience. That's a very good combination. <laughs> Julia, I would like to ask one question from Abrar. Sure. Abrar, uh, I'm very, really, very pleased to hear about your project. And uh, we are always in a fix for to minimize the role of the middlemen in our agriculture. We don't have much storage facilities in Pakistan, though we always try to incentivize the people to build more and more storage facilities in Pakistan. So I'm really very much intrigued with your project, how you are going to minimize the role of the middlemen. I understand that a lot of profit margins are there for the other, other retailers and everybody else. So are you, who, who, who are you are trying to connect the, the, the customer with the, with the producer? Really, it is intriguing me that because without building warehouses, storage facilities, and then, you know, I don't know how, how you people are going to do it. So a great question. I think the answer is today for us is that, you know, we have to reduce the time between the point of harvest to the point of delivery to the retailer. And in doing so, we build a very lean supply chain. So wherein, you know, we don't need a lot of warehouses. So what we do actually, we currently have four warehouses in Lahore. We have two in Karachi now. We, we, we probably are going to have one in Islamabad. You know, we, we're building on top of all of them. But uh, we don't do long-term storage. We currently are not into, say, wheat, rice, or some of these other grains. We are purely focused on fruits and vegetables. And what we ensure is that before the product gets wasted, it gets to... A customer so what we make sure is that the point the time between the point of harvest for example for mangoes for onions for potatoes is as soon as it gets harvested it gets to our central warehouse then it goes to our smaller fulfillment centers and then eventually to the customer and the time window is very limited and therefore we don't need extensive warehouse if we get into grains of course it becomes a different kind of problem but at this point in time with fruits and vegetables to ensure that by building a very lean sorry for interrupting you again no 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 please I have worked in agriculture sector as additional secretary agriculture in Punjab. And I have done a lot of work in the agriculture sector as well in pesticide, fertilizers, zoning. And you might be looking for to, to place yourself in place of the other commission agent maybe. Because otherwise, I it, it's a good thing. I, I would again support it that if somebody is there making investment and you have a big group at your back as well, Jahangir Siddiqui, Mr. and JS Group. So I, I, I am pleased to hear that you you people are even if you are building uh, those warehouses, because there are a lot of goods which are perishable, which have to be, I can understand you might be using artificial intelligence and having a lot of data of the customers, a lot of orders, and, and you, you may be quick in, in, in disposing of the products, especially the perishable goods. But again, it would be more, this, the solution will be making investments in, in the harder part as well as in, in the softer part as well. So it, it's, it's a combination of both these things, maybe. Okay, I think great point, but just one correction. So Jahangir Siddiqui, probably Mr. Khalid's backer. We are generally backed by global investors, including oh, global okay, sorry, capital. Sorry. So we, we, so just one correction over there. But uh, your point is exactly correct. We just are in the dilemma mostly of how are we a technology company or not? And as a technology company, we have to minimize investments on physical warehouses. Otherwise, when that money generally needs to be channeled on technology development, human resource and all. But we keep thinking about these ideas. We, we 
we work with people who actually make these investments on our behalf, which you, like you said, are essential to be successful. But as the, the money that we raise ourselves, we generally try to channel it in working capital, maybe in technology development, in human resource, but not in building physical assets. So I hope you understand our dilemma to do with it. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. What actually will your operating system that you're building out look like in its end state, Abra? So it's going to be, we think about, and this is a bit of a childish vision of the future. What we think about the future is that, you know, there are farmers who interact with the platform or the operating system through their app. They're told what to grow, when to grow, and when to harvest. There are collection centers close to where farmers grow what they grow. And those collection centers are operated by independent entities. Logistics is also connected through APIs. Produce gets into large warehouses in the cities. Again, warehouses managed by third parties. And AZA as a platform is only providing pricing on, on all ends. It's providing uh, demand and supply forecasting, and it's basically orchestrating, orchestrating the supply chain, which has multiple nodes, multiple people, but Taza is a technology overlay over what's really happening. So that's our vision of the future. It, it, when you look at Pakistan's current supply chain, you would think I'm crazy, but <laughs> this is what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you already have a very famous name in Pakistan. And uh, in the shape of uh, Epicard, we have connected the customer right from right with Epicard yeah. and the customer of Taza Mart. Why not? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, mean, Absolutely. I was in the discussion with Mohsen as well. It's co fund. So the Academy of Possible Synergy is definitely between Epicard and Taza because we're into the entire shopping experience and we can be our, a good supply chain. Absolutely. We, we look forward to serving. This, uh, I have another question from, from a participant, Khaled. They say there's a huge competition in the grocery delivery services in Pakistan. For example, big grocery brands deliver the groceries themselves. So how will you cope with this competition? Excellent question. That is the case. However, there is not customer loyalty because of the price sensitivity. Whoever is, as I've mentioned in my presentation, people are spending 42% of their income on grocery. So they are really careful in spending every rupee on the product. So wherever they get, so the pictures I showed you were basically the offers and, and something on a very good discounted rates in a mart. So that's why people are crazy on that. It was just like, it looked like a doomsday, but that's how it is. Now, this, the unit economics which I touched on is basically the entire uh, science of basket size and basket pricing. In order to solve that, what we have done is we have introduced our own product brand, which are of staple foods. So likes of rice and pulses and sugar, salt, all the basic 27, 28 items. So we have a supply chain of rice, pulses, sugar, and everything. I get it at most discounted rates. And I've established such an excellent supply chain that has a supply directly to the consumer, at least 20% lesser rates. Even then I make 30 to 40% profit on those particular items. So if I look at the combined basket size, it where I get four to 5% on my FMCG or branded products, I get a higher margin on the own product. So the combined basket is giving me sustainability. So even I can give away further to the customer. So now coming back, this price sensitivity. So if I can, buy for less. So what I, uh, in my family, I was told that you make the profit when you purchase, not when you sell. So if you purchase at the right price, you can sell it at the right price. So obviously, but because of an excellent supply chain and less expense, admin expenses like bricks and mortars and maintenance of the stores and everything, we can supply at a lot cheaper rate. And we, uh, as I mentioned, we are not just in the right race of delivering fast, but also delivering economically. So that's what I truly believe that we can excel and there's a huge market potential. I hope that answers. Oh, that's an amazing answer. Yeah, there's something there for all of us, I think, isn't there? Yes, that you make your profit when you buy that, that we should all, that's a great takeaway for everybody. I have a question, I think, for both panelists, which I see from somebody in the audience. They say e-commerce is a major growth sector. Globally, how have these startup platforms raised capital to date? And is the sector open to external investment from abroad? Well, I think we already heard a little bit about that. But Abra, maybe you go first and then Khaled on this, please. I think at this point in time, Pakistan's regulatory uh, structure is getting has gotten significantly better over the last one, two years, uh, wherein uh, you can, as for example, as a founder in Pakistan, 
I can be an owner of the whole co company outside Pakistan. And this is becoming a pretty common structure across the startups that I see. Multiple startups have whole, uh, whole co's in Singapore, Dubai, the US, Cayman, you know, multiple other places which are uh, investor friendly. And uh, so we, we've been able to seamlessly raise capital outside Pakistan. Uh, most of our capital that we've raised to date, to date is from outside Pakistan, from international investors. And uh, the market is opening up. In fact, Pakistan market is right now in spotlight of international investors. And uh, it's a great time to sort of raise capital from Pakistan. For Thank you. Khaled? Uh, I completely agree with Abrar. International investors are basically eyeing it. Our startup, so we've raised just funding from internally within the founders. And now we are going for our next round of investment. So seeking uh, to raise some investments. So yes, we are open to take the investments. In terms of the structure, uh, as Abrar briefly touched on, they have a whole co structure, which is basically operating either from a Dutch entity or through Abu Dhabi, Middle Eastern entities. That's how we are operating at the moment, basically. Thank you. It's interesting for me. I don't hear Hong Kong in any of these structures. Maybe that's an opportunity for Hong Kong. <laughs> it's definitely something can be done, actually. Yeah, yeah. Asim, do you have any another question for the panel? Yes, I think, uh, Julia, you can also read a few questions in the uh, Q&A tab, you know. Yes, sure. Uh, you have some questions here as well. Yeah, sure. One question I have is for Khaled. So while the dark store model is gaining popularity worldwide and is leading valuation deals, are there actually any profit success stories in this using this model? What do you think about that? So that's an amazing question. And there were some articles on it as well. So there are a lot of companies, they have become decacons, not even unicorns very soon. And they operate more than thousands of dark stores in countries like Turkey and Russia and in the West. Yes, that's right. They have not been proved to be uh, profitable, though they are successful. And I see a huge gap in the market. So it will still come. The key thing is the unit economics. If the contribution is positive uh, within next three to five years, then yes, it can turn into a success story. And that's exactly what we are working on. We are not only into delivering fast so that our unit economic increases drastically because otherwise you'll end up building lots and lots of warehouses, dark stores that will completely de dest destroy your unit economics. So we are focusing on unit economics as well because as I've said, I, I repeat for the third time, people are more price sensitive. So if I deliver a craving of a can of Coke or a crisp, in 10 minutes, that's fine, but grocery cheaper is preferable than fast. So uh, inside entire basket, so that, that will add, and I'm sure that we will turn it around and perhaps a first success story to become successful and profitable. Thank you. Julia, before, before you people are going to answer and question, uh, question and answer session, I would like to ask a quick, quick question from both of my friends. Do you have evaluation of your companies and have you assessed what kind of and how much investment is needed and what would be the rate of return down the road, maybe after three or five years rate of return? This might help the investors to understand what kind of and how much investment is needed and how much return they are going to get down the road. Yeah, yeah okay. Yes, Mr. Bilal, we, we have a detailed, exhaustive financial model prepared, for which, we can, which can be shared with the entrusted investors, which explains the entire journey of the growth, our historic, the financial numbers, the num amount of investment required, where the investment is going to be spent, how much we are expected to earn, what the valuation is at the moment and it is expected to be and how much return the investors can get uh, and what can be the exit rounds or next rounds of investments or the exit strategy. So we have a detailed pack with us basically, which can be shared with interested or potential investors. So in our case, I think uh, we raise money from different uh, sort of set of investors who are mainly focused on venture capital. In venture capital, the risk propensity is much higher. So they are, for us, the raising money so far has been on just pitch decks and a few financial models. Uh, there have been no sophisticated, I come from a finance background. So for us, there's so far no been, not been any uh, sophisticated financial evaluations, including IRRs or NPVs or, you know, all of that. For us, it has been mainly about what our multiple of our GMP has been. And the people who generally invest in venture, you know, which is basically a high risk investment, 
they also are aware generally that you know nine out of ten or, or maybe nine and a half out of the ten investments are going to go go belly up, and uh, only one or probably half of those ten investments are going to be successful. But the idea for them is to make sure that that is a big one, right? In, on that one investment, they make a lot of money. So there's like different classes of investors people raise money from, and they have different kinds of profiles, different kind of return outlooks also. Thank you. I think that gives everybody an overview of the valuation issue. I think we have time for probably two more quick questions for, for both of our wonderful startups. There's one from the uh, a participant. What would your advice be to capture the eyes of new investors if you're a new startup? So this is asking you, I think, to advise other perhaps startups at an embryonic stage that your companies are at. Khaled? Yeah, okay. I think somebody told me that um, if you are here to serve the community and if you're if if you are passionate about something and that something can transform the community and the society that can add the value if you're serving the society then it's definitely worth it and you can you do all you need to do is just work hard have the right people in the team have the right business model be at the right time at the right space in the right place then it's just a matter of advertising it you raise the capital basically Thank you, Khaled. That's a tall order. Right place, right time, team. <laughs> Abra? I think you should go after a problem that you're very really passionate about. But from uh, a couple of logistics, I think things that really help you sort of stand uh, differently from the crowd is basically, one, you go after a very large problem or a very large-sized uh, market. Two, if you generally have a, a startup experience that me generally helps switch, at least the VC investors think about you slightly differently. And three, I've seen that if you have early traction and then you start raising, it becomes easier. If it's just a concept, it uh, becomes a bit of a problem and they want to see a bit of traction. So I think just two or three things to add. Thank you. And I think a final question from me, Abra, where do you see Tezar Tech in um, five years' time, in your dreams? And perhaps in so reality. That, so that dream uh, is basically the, what, what I sort of alluded to earlier, which is a very high-level technology overlay, which is connecting multiple pieces of the supply chain and making sure that there is less wastage. There is a very high efficiency. And this dream, uh, this sort of model being replicated across multiple markets, wherein building a network of food supply, food and agriculture supply chain uh, across multiple markets with space, space similar problems. So that's where we want to be. Thank you. And uh, Khaled, how will Apricard have changed the world in five years? Five years time, realistically, not the entire world, but uh, I'm sure about Pakistan itself and some countries around Pakistan, high growth countries, countries with, uh, which are densely populated. So definitely for sure, we will be spending in there. And as, as I've said, that's our team's dream to transform the way people shop and just take off from their head uh, the grocery stress. Thank you. Asim, Consul General, would you like to say a few words before we close, either of you? Julia, thank you very much. I have, I think we had a very uh, exhaustive session. Friends from Pakistan, Abrar and Khalid, I'm really uh, deeply impressed with the, the, the work they have done and they're doing. And I really wish them best of luck. And I really want to see them as unicorns very soon. In my prayers are with them. And uh, I, I expect that the investors from Pakistan, uh, from Hong Kong, they should try to understand the Pakistani landscape. There's a lot of potential exists because we are a big population of 220 million people. We are a big consumer market and the living standard of people are increasing. We have young population. People are more inclined towards e-commerce and there is a lot of potential. As I mentioned while talking to Abrar that there is a lot of scopes in the construction of the warehousing and then connecting them to the consumers. And similar is the case with the project of Khaled that there is a lot of potential which exists and obviously almost 20% of our income is consumed in the grocery items. And still the market is at the nascent stage. There are tremendous potentials. This is the right time for investment because five to 10 years that the people who will be in the market, they will be the market leaders. And uh, I expect that this is the time to invest in Pakistan. And I wish them good luck, uh, best of luck for them. And I'm grateful to the Commonwealth Chamber for uh, organizing this webinar. I'm really grateful to you, Julia, and to all of your team. And I would really love to you know, uh, participate uh, and uh, to do, be part of such as much as you would require us to do. We are always at your call. 
with a very short notice. So thank you very much, all of you. I'm grateful and honored. Thank you so much, Consul General. We're very honored um, to, to have you joining us today and contributing so much of your own enormous knowledge. That brings us to the conclusion of this webinar. And I'm so excited about what we've heard today from CEO Khaled Memon and um, Abra Bajwa. What amazing companies you have. I'm sure you're going to go from strength to strength. It's all terribly exciting. Thank you so much for being with us today. And um, special thanks again to Consul General, but it really means a lot. And to my wonderful co-moderator, Asim Malik, who is very much involved not only today, but also in the arrangements leading up to this webinar. Thank you all very much for joining. Your views matter to us. So before um, exiting completely, please could you kindly complete the evaluation form that's linked in the chat box. Once you click the link, please scan the QR code and you'll be able to use it. At the same time, if you'd like to join the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce, uh, you can tick the box option as well. We look forward to seeing you again on another webinar soon. Thank you and goodbye.